Welcome back, Billionaires. So happy and grateful that you are here. My name is Vanessa Black, and I am one of the founders and owners of Billionaire, where we are on a mission to impact the lives of billions of incredible, beautiful souls of women all over the world to achieve personal freedom in their life, as well as financial freedom. And one of the ways we're doing that is reading books that align with personal freedom or financial freedom. We're reading two books a month. Isabel reads the financial freedom book of the month, and I read the personal freedom. And this month's personal freedom featured book is Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. We are currently um, on chapter three, the vulnerability armory and part two of three. So let's dive right into it. Excited to hear your thoughts. If you've been following along and if it's your first time, welcome. Let us know in the comments. We're so happy and grateful that you are here as well. So page 131. Daring greatly, appreciating the beauty of cracks. Just as our experiences of forebodying joy can be located on a continuum, I found that most of us fall somewhere on a perfectionism continuum. In other words, when it comes to hiding our flaws, managing perception, and wanting to win over folks, we're all hustling a little. For some folks, perfectionism may only emerge when they're feeling particularly vulnerable. For others, perfectionism is compulsive, chronic, and debilitating. It looks and feels like an addiction. Regardless of where we are in the continuum, if we want freedom from perfectionism, we have to make the long journey from what will people think to I am enough. That journey begins with shame, resilience, self-compassion, and owning our stories. To claim the truth about who we are, where we come from, what we believe, and the very imperfect nature of our lives, we have to be willing to give ourselves a break and appreciate the beauty of our cracks or imperfections, to be kinder and gentler with ourselves and each other, to talk to ourselves the same way we talk to someone we care about. Yes. Dr. Kristen Neff, a researcher and professor at the University of Texas at Austin, runs a self-compassion research lab where she studies how we develop and practice self-compassion. According to Neff, self-compassion has three elements, self-kindness, common humanity, and mindfulness. In her new book, Self-Comparison, Stop Beating Yourself Up and Leave Insecurity Behind, she defines each of these elements. Self-kindness, being warm and understanding toward ourselves when we suffer, fail, or feel inadequate rather than ignoring our pain or flagellating ourselves with self-criticism. Next, common humanity. Common humanity recognizes that suffering and feelings of personal inadequacy are part of the shared human experience, something we all go through rather than something that happens to me alone. Mindfulness. Taking a balanced approach to negative emotions so that feelings are never suppressed nor exaggerated. We cannot ignore our pain and feel compassion for it at the same time. Mindfulness requires that we not over-identify with thoughts and feelings so that we are caught up and swept away by negativity. I love how our definition of mindfulness reminds us that being mindful also means not over-identifying with and exaggerating our feelings. For me, it's so easy to get stuck in regret or shame or self-criticism when I make a mistake, but self-compassion requires an observant and accurate perspective when feeling shame or pain. Neff has a great website where you can take a self-compassion inventory and learn more about her research. The web address is www.selfcompassion.org. In addition to practicing self-compassion and trust me, like gratitude and everything else worthwhile, it's a practice. We must also remember that our worthiness, that core belief that we are enough, comes only when we live inside our story. We either own our stories, even the messy ones, or we stand outside of them, denying our vulnerabilities and imperfections, orphaning the parts of us that don't fit in with who slash what we think we're supposed to be, and hustling for other people's approval of our worthiness. Perfectionism is exhausting because hustling is exhausting. It's a never-ending performance. I want to go back now to inspiration interviews series. 
from my blog and share some of the responses with you. In these responses, I see the beauty of being real, of embracing the crafts, and I'm inspired by the self-compassion. I think they'll inspire you too. The first is from Gretchen Rubin, the best-selling writer that, with whose book, The Happiness Project, is the account of the year she spent test-driving studies and theories about how to be happier. Her new book, Happier at Home, focuses on the factors that matter at home, such as possessions, marriage, time, parenthood, neighborhood. Here's how she answered the question about managing perfectionism. I remind myself, don't let the perfect be the enemy of good. A 20-minute walk that I do is better than the four-mile run that I don't do. The imperfect book that gets published is better than the perfect book that never leaves my computer. And the dinner party of takeout Chinese food is better than the elegant dinner that I never host. Andrea Schur is a photographer, writer, and life coach living in Berkeley, California. Through her e-courses, Superhero Photo, and Mondo Biondo, and her award-winning blog, Superhero Journal, Andrea inspires others to live authentic, colorful, and creative lives. You can often find her sitting on the kitchen floor holding her new baby and asking four-year-old son to help leap so she can take a superhero portrait. She writes her here about perfectionism. I love her mantras. I was a competitive gymnast as a kid, got perfect attendance every year in school, was terrified of getting anything worse than an A minus, and had an eating disorder in high school. Oh, and I think I was the homecoming queen. Yep, I think I have some issues with perfectionism, but I have been working on it. As a kid, I equated being perfect with being loved. And I think I still confuse it too. I often find myself doing what Brene calls, quote, the hustle for worthiness. <clears throat> That dance we do so that people don't see how incredibly flawed and human we are. Sometimes I have my self-worth wrapped up in what I do and how good I look doing it, but mostly I'm learning to let go. Parenthood has taught me a lot about that. It's messy and humbling, and I'm learning to show my mess. To manage my perfectionism, I give myself tons of permission to do the things that are good enough. I do things quickly. Having two small children will teach you how to do most tasks at lightning speed. And if it's good enough, it gets my stamp of approval. I have mantras that help. Quick and dirty wins the race. Perfectionism is the enemy of done. Good enough is really effing good. Nicholas Wilton is the artist behind the beautiful illustrations on my earlier book covers on my website. In addition to showings and galleries, exhibi exhibitions, and inclusion in private collections, he is a founder of the Art Plane Method, a system of fundamental painting and intuition principles that help enable the creative process. I absolutely love what he writes about perfectionism in art. It completely aligns with the research finding that perfectionism crushes creativity, which is why one of the most effective ways to start recovering from perfectionism is to start creating. Here's what Nikki, Nick has to say. I always felt that someone a long time ago organized the affairs of the world into the areas that made sense. Categories of stuff that is perfectable, things that fit near, neatly in perfect bundles. The world of business, for example, is this way. Line items, spreadsheets, things that add up that can be perfected. The legal system, not always perfect, but nonetheless a mind-numbing effort to actually write down all kinds of laws and instructions that cover all aspects of human, human. a kind of umbrella code of conduct we should all follow. Perfectionism is crucial in building an aircraft, a bridge or a high-speed train. The code and mathematics residing just below the surface of the internet is also this way. Things are either perfectly right or they will not work. So much of the world we work and live in is based upon being correct, being perfect. But after this, someone got through organizing everything just perfectly. He, or probably a she, was left with a bunch of stuff that didn't fit anywhere. Things in the shoebox that had to go somewhere. So in desperation, this person threw up her arms and said, okay, fine. All the rest of this stuff isn't perfectable. That doesn't seem to fit anywhere else. We'll just have to be piled into this last, rather large, tattered box that we can sort of push behind the couch. Maybe later we can come back and figure where it all is supposed to fit in. 
Let's label the box art. The problem was thankfully never fixed. And in the time, the box overflowed as more and more art piled up. I think the dilemma exists because art, among all the other tidy categories, most closely resembles what it is like to be human, to be alive. It is our nature to be imperfect, to have uncategorized feelings and emotion, to make or do things that don't sometimes necessarily make sense. Once the word art enters the description of what you're up to, it is almost like getting a hall pass from perfection. It thankfully releases us from any expectation of perfection. In relation to my own work not being perfect, I just always point to the tattered box behind the couch and mention the word art. And people always seem to understand and let you off the hook about being perfect and go back to their business. There's a quote that I share every time I talk about vulnerability and perfectionism. My fixation with these words from Leonard Cohen's song, Anthem, comes from how much comfort and hope they give me as I put enough into practice. That's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Sorry, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. The shield, numbing. If you're wondering if this section is about addiction and you're thinking, this isn't about me, please read on. This is about all of us. First, one of the most universal numbing strategies is what I call crazy busy. I often say that when they start having 12-step meetings for busy alcoholics, they'll need to rent out football stadiums. We are a culture of people who have bought into the idea that if we stay busy enough, the truth of our lives won't catch up with us. Second, statistics dictate that there are very few people who haven't been affected by addiction. I believe we all numb our feelings. We may not do it compulsively and chronically, which is addiction, but that doesn't mean that we don't numb our sense of vulnerability. And numbing vulnerability is especially debilitating because it just doesn't just deaden the pain of our difficult experiences. Numbing vulnerability also dulls our experiences of love, joy, belonging, creativity, empathy. We can't selectively numb emotion, numb the dark, and you numb the light. If you're also wondering if numbing refers to doing illegal drugs or having a few glasses of wine after work, the answer is yes. I'm going to argue that we need to examine the idea of taking the edge off. And that means considering the glasses of wine we drink while we're cooking dinner, eating dinner, and cleaning up after dinner are 60-hour work weeks. The sugar, the fantasy football, the prescription pills, and the four shots of espresso that we drink in order to clear the fog from the wine and Advil PM. I'm talking about you and me and the stuff we do every day. When I looked at the data, my primary question was, what are we numbing and why? Americans today are most debt-ridden, obese, medicated, and addicted than we have ever been. For the first time in history, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has announced that automobile accidents are now the second leading cause of accidental death in the United States. The leading cause? Drug overdoses. In fact, more people die from prescription drug overdoses than from heroin, cocaine, and metamethamine drug use combined. Even more alarming is the estimate that less than 5% of those who die from the prescription drug overdoses obtain their drugs from the folks we normally think of as a street corner drug dealer. The dealers today are more likely to be parents, relatives, friends, and physicians. Clearly, there's a problem. We're desperate to feel less or more of something, to make something go away, or to have more of something else. Having spent years working closely with addiction, researchers, and clinicians, I had guessed that the primary driver of numbing would be our struggles with worthiness and shame. We numb the pain that comes from feeling inadequate and less than, but that was the part, only part of the puzzle. Anxiety and disconnection also emerge as drivers of numbing in addition to shame. As I'll explain, the most powerful need for numbing seems to come from combinations of all three, shame, anxiety, and disconnection. The anxiety described by the research participants appear to be fueled by uncertainty, overwhelming and competing demands on our time 
And one of the big surprises, social discomfort. This connection was tougher to nail down. I thought about using the term depression rather than disconnection, but as I recoded the data, that's not what I heard. Instead, I heard a range of experiences that encompassed depression, but also included loneliness, isolation, disengagement, and emptiness. Again, what was really powerful for me personally and professionally was seeing the strong pattern of shame threading through the experiences of anxiety and or disconnection. The most accurate answers to the question about what drives numbing sounds more like the answers to what's your sign? Anxiety with shame rising, disconnection with shame rising, anxiety and disconnection with shame rising. Shame enters for those of us who experience anxiety because not only are we feeling fearful, out of control and incapable of managing our increasingly demanding lives, but eventually our anxiety is compounded and made unbearable by our belief. That if we were just smarter, stronger, or better, we'd be able to handle everything. Numbing here becomes a way to take the edge off of both instability and inadequacy. With disconnection, it's a similar story. We may have a couple of hundred friends on Facebook, plus a slew of colleagues, real life friends and neighbors, but we feel alone and unseen. Because we are hardwired for connection, Disconnection always creates pain. Feeling disconnected can be a normal part of life and relationships, but when coupled with the shame and believing that we're disconnected because we're not worthy of connection, it creates a pain that we want to numb. One stop beyond disconnection is isolation, which presents real danger. Jean Baker Miller and Irene Stiver, relational culture theorists from the Stone Center at uh, Wellesley College have eloquently captured the extremity of isolation. They write, we believe that the most terrifying and destructive feeling that a person can experience is psychological isolation. This is not the same as being alone. It is a feeling that one is locked out of the possibility of human connection and of being powerless to change a situation. In the extreme, psychological isolation can lead to a sense of hopelessness and desperation. People will do almost anything to escape this combination of condemned isolation and powerlessness. The part of this definition that is critical to understanding shame is the sentence, quote, people will do almost anything to escape this combination and condemn isolation and powerlessness. Shame often leads to desperation. And reactions to this desperate need to escape from isolation and fear can run the gamut from numbing to addiction, depression, self-injury, eating disorders, bullying, violence, and suicide. As I thought back on my own numbing history, understanding how shame magnifies anxiety and disconnection provided me with the answers to questions that I've had for years. I didn't start drinking to drown my sorrows. I just needed something to do with my hands. In fact, I'm convinced that if smartphones and the bejeweled chihuahuas that today's celebrities sport as accessories had been in fashion when I was in my late teens, I never would have started smoking and drinking. I drank and smoked to minimize my feelings of vulnerability and to look busy when all the other girls on my table had been asked to dance. I literally needed something to do something to help me look busy. 25 years ago, it felt as if my only choice was nursing a beer, stirring an amaretto sour, or fiddling with a cigarette. I was alone in the table with no one, nothing to keep me company except for my vices. For me, vulnerability led to anxiety, which led to shame, which led to disconnection, which led to Bud Light. For many of us, the literal chemical anesthetizing of emotions is just as pleasant. Outbite dangerous, side effect of behaviors that are more about fitting in, finding connection, and managing anxiety. I quit drinking and smoking 16 years ago. In the gifts of imperfection, I write, I wasn't raised with the skills and emotional practice needed to lean into discomfort. So over time, I basically became a take the edge off alcoholic. But they don't have meetings for that. And after some brief experimenting, I learned that describing your addiction that way in a traditional 12-step meeting doesn't always go over very well with the person. 
Pirates. For me, it was just the dance halls, cold beer, and Marvel Eliza of my youth that got out of hand. It was banana bread, chips and queso, email, work, staying busy, and <clears throat> incessant worrying, planning, perfectionism, and anything else that could dull those agonizing and anxiety fueled feelings of vulnerability. Let's look at the Daring Greatly strategies for numbing. Page 142, Daring Greatly. Setting boundaries, finding true comfort, and cultivating spirit. When I interviewed the research participants, whom I describe as living a wholehearted life, about numbing, they consistently talked about these three things. One, learning how to actually feel their feelings. Staying mindful about numbing behaviors. That was number two, Str they struggled too. And number three, learning how to lean into the discomfort of hard emotions. This one made perfect sense to me, but I wanted to know exactly how you lean into anxiety disconnection. So I started interviewing people about this question specifically. As I expected, there's more to it. These folks had elevated enough to whole new levels. Yes, they practice mindfulness and leaning, but they also set serious boundaries in their lives. As I asked more pointed questions about the choices and behaviors wholehearted men and women made to reduce anxiety, they explained that reducing anxiety meant paying attention to how much they could do and how much was too much and learning how to say enough. They got very clear on what was important to them and when they could let something go. In Sir Ken Robinson's wonderful 2010 TED Talk, on the learning revolution, he starts to explain to the audience that he divides the world into two groups. Then he stops himself and with great humor says, Jeremy Bentham, the great Altarian philosopher, once spiked this argument. He said, there are two types of people in the world, those who divide people into two types and those who do not. Robinson paused and smiled. Well, I do. I love that because as a researcher, I do too. But before I talk about the two groups I had identified, I want to say that this division is not exactly as neat and tidy as two discrete groups. And at the same time, it is almost is. Let's take a look. When it comes to anxiety, we, we all struggle. Yes, there are different types of anxiety and certainly different intensities. Some anxiety is hardwired and best addressed with a combination of medication and therapy and some of it is environmental. We're overextended and overstressed. What was interesting to me was how the participants could be divided into two camps. Group A defined the challenge of anxiety as finding ways to manage and soothe anxiety, while Group B clearly defined the problem as changing the behaviors that led to anxiety. Participants from both groups often use today's dominating technology as an example of an anxiety producing source during the interview. So let's look at how these two groups thought differently about the daily onslaught of email, voicemail, and text messages. Group A, I make a pot of coffee after I tuck in my kids so I can take care of all the emails between 10 p.m. and midnight. There are too many I wake up at 4 a.m. and start over again. I don't like getting to work with any unanswered email in my inbox. I'm exhausted, but they're answered. Group B, I simply stop sending unnecessary. I've simply stopped sending unnecessary emails and asked my friends and colleagues to do the same. I've also started setting the expectation that it might take me a few days to respond. If it's important, call me. Don't text or email. Call, better yet, stop by my office. Group A, I, I use red lights, grocery lines, and elevator rides to stay on top of my calls. I even sleep with my phone in case someone calls or I remember something in the middle of the night. One time I called my assistant at 4 a.m. because I remembered that we needed to add something to a motion that we were preparing. I was surprised that she answered, but then she reminded me that I had told her to keep her phone on right on her nightstand. I'll rest and let off steam when we're done. Work hard, play hard. That's my motto. And it doesn't take much to play hard when you haven't slept in a while. Group B, 
My boss, my friends, and my family know that I don't take calls before 9 a.m. or after 9 p.m. If the phone rings after or before those times, it's either a wrong number or an emergency, a real emergency, not a work issue. The participants who struggled the most with numbing, Group A explained that reducing anxiety meant finding ways to numb it, not changing the thinking behaviors or emotions that created Anxiety. I hated every minute of this part of the research. I've always looked for better ways to manage my exhaustion and anxiety. I wanted to help living like this, not suggestions on how to stop living like this. My struggle mirrored the struggle that I heard from the folks who talked the most about numbing. The smaller group, Group B, participants who addressed anxiety at the root by aligning their lives with their values and setting boundaries, fell on the wholehearted continuum. When we asked a group about the process of setting boundaries and limits to lower the anxiety in their lives, they didn't hesitate to connect worthiness with boundaries. We have to believe we are enough in order to say enough. It's a good line right there. For a woman, setting boundaries is difficult because the shame gremlins are quick to weigh in. Careful saying no. You'll really disappoint these folks. Don't let them down. Be a good girl. Make everyone happy. For men, the gremlins whispered, man up. A real guy could take this on and then some. Is the little mama's boy just too tired? We know that daring greatly means engaging with our vulnerability. Which can't happen when shame has the upper hand. And the same is true for dealing with anxiety field disconnection. The two most powerful forms of connections are love and belonging. They are both irreducible needs of men, women, and children. As I conducted my interviews, I realized the only one thing separated the men and women who felt a deep sense of love and belonging from the people who seemed to be struggling for it. That one thing was a belief in their worthiness. It's a simple it's as simple and complicated as this. If we want to fully experience love and belonging, we must believe that we are worthy of love and belonging. But before we talk more about numbing and disconnection, I want to share two more definitions with you. I shared my definition of love on page 105. Here are the definitions of connection and belonging that emerge from the data. Belonging. Belonging is innate human desire to be part of something larger than us. Because this yearning is so primal, we often try to acquire it by fitting in and by seeking approval, which are not only hollow substitutes for belonging, but often barriers to it. Because true belonging only happens when we present our authentic, imperfect selves to the world. Our sense of belonging can never be greater than our level of self-acceptance. These definitions are crucial to understanding how we become disconnected in our lives and how to change. Living a connected life ultimately is about setting boundaries, spending less time and energy hustling and winning over people who don't matter, and seeing the value of working on cultivating connection with family and close friends. Before I undertook the research, my question was, what's the quickest way to make these feelings go away? Today, my question is, where are these feelings and where did they come from? Invariably, the answers are that I'm not feeling connected enough to Steve or the kids and that this comes from, take your pick, not sleeping enough, not playing enough, working too much, or trying to run away from vulnerability. What has changed for me is that I know now that I can address these answers. Page 146, the care and feeding of our spirits. One final question remains, and I hear it a lot. People often ask, where is the line between pleasure or comfort and numbing? In response, author and personal growth teacher Jennifer Loudon has named our numbing devices shadow comforts. When we're anxious, disconnected, and vulnerable, alone and feeling helpless, the booze and food and work and endless hours online feel like comfort. But in reality, they're only casting their long shadows over our lives. In her book, The Life Organizer, Loudon writes, shadow comforts can take any form. It's not what you do, it's why you do it that makes all the difference. You can eat a piece of chocolate as a holy wafer of sweetness, a real comfort, or you can cram an entire chocolate bar into your mouth without even tasting it in a frantic attempt to soothe yourself. A shadow comfort. You can chat on a message boards for half an hour and be organized by community and ready to go back to work. Or 
You can chat on message boards because you're avoiding talking to your partner about how angry he or she made you last night. I found that what emerged from the data was exactly what Loudon points out. It's not what you do. It's why you do it that makes the difference. The invitation is to think about the intention behind our choices and if helpful to discuss these issues with family, close friends, or a helping professional. There aren't any checklists or norms to help you identify shadow comforts or other destructive numbing behavior. This requires self-examination and reflection. Additionally, I would recommend listening with great care if the people you love say that you are concerned about you engaging in these types of behaviors. But ultimately, these are questions that transcend what we know and how we feel. They're about our spirit. Are my choices comforting and nourishing my spirit, or are they temporary reprieves from vulnerability and difficult emotions ultimately diminishing my spirit? Are my choices leading to my wholeheartedness, or do they leave me feeling empty or searching? For me, sitting down to a wonderful meal is nourishment and pleasure. Eating while I'm standing, being in front of the refrigerator and inside the pantry is always a red flag. Sitting down to watch one of my favorite shows on television is pleasure. Flipping through channels for an hour is numbing. As we think about nourishing or diminishing our spirit, we have to consider how our numbing behaviors affect the people around us, even strangers. A couple of years ago, I wrote an opt-out about cell phones and disconnection from the Houston Chronicle. After witnessing how our crazy, busy, anxiety-filled lifestyles affect other people. Food for thought. Spirituality emerged as a fundamental guidepost in wholeheartedness. Not religiosity, but the deeply held belief that we're inextricably connected to one another by a force greater than ourselves. A force grounded in love and compassion. For some of us, that's God. And for others, it's nature, art, or even human soulfulness. I believe that owning our worthiness is the act of acknowledging that we are scared or sacred. Sorry. <laughs> acknowledging that we are sacred. Perhaps embracing vulnerability and overcoming numbing is ultimately about the care and feeding of our spirits. The less frequented shelves in the armory. So far, we've cracked open, the, cracked open the armory doors to throw some light on the common arsenal that pretty much everyone uses to keep themselves safe from vulnerability. Forebodying joy, perfectionism, and numbing have emerged as the three most universal methods of protection. What we call major categories of defense. In this past part of the chapter, chapter I want to briefly explore the less frequent shelves in the armory for a few more masks and pieces that form important subcategories of shielding are kept most of us are likely to identify with one or more of these protection mechanisms or at the very least we will see silvers of ourselves reflected back from their polished surfaces in a way that cultivates some understanding the shield viking or victim I recognize this piece of armor when a significant group of research participants indicated they had very little use for the concept of vulnerability. Their responses to the idea that vulnerability might have value ranged from dismissive and defensive to hostile. What emerged from these interviews was, well, these interviews and interactions was a lens on the world that essentially saw people divided into two groups, Ahem, like me, and Sir Ken Robinson that I call Vikings or victims and that concludes part two of three in this particular chapter the vulnerability armory and in the next read with me session we are going to dive into the last parts of this particular chapter would love to know your thoughts so far on this chapter on the armories of vulnerability and your feedback Appreciate you. I hope you're enjoying this and getting value from this book so far. Let me know in the comments if you are. Hit a thumbs up if you are. Share this video with a friend or a family member or a loved one um, if you're finding value from it because I'm sure someone else can find value as well. Understanding shame, understanding vulnerability, understanding just going deep into these words is super, super powerful to understand and, and provide a clarity. So super grateful and excited you are here. Looking forward to seeing you very soon in the next Read With Me session. Hope you have a beautiful day, beautiful evening, wherever you are in the world, Billionaire. And appreciate you. And we'll see you soon. Take care.